Yesterday, we, I, I brought up the issue of, you know, actually somebody called in, several people called in about what was going on in Brazil, and my knowledge of that was pretty cursory. Um, so I said, you know, we'll, we'll get somebody on who really knows what they're talking about. Today, I pointed out that China's credit markets, according to the New York Times, froze up overnight, and there are various theories about this. I shared three of them with you. But again, I'm not an expert on these things, so let's talk to one. Mark Weisbrot is with us. He is the co- is back with us. He's been on the program before. He's co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research, CEPR, the co-author with Dean Baker of the book Social Security, The Phony Crisis. Their website site is CEPR, as in Center for Economic and Policy Research, CEPR.net. And Mark, welcome back to the program. Thanks, Tom. It's great to have you with us. So uh, which do you want to take first, China or Brazil? Your pick. Okay, uh, let's uh, let's start with China because I'm guessing Brazil is going to take a little longer. And uh, what do you think is going on in China? Well, you know, you've had the growth of this the kind of a shadow banking system like we have in the U.S. Instead of just you know banks making loans, there's these they're offering these uh, products to at higher interest rates people, and they're taking advantage of the fact that the government, like here, well, even more you know, has to bail them out when they get into trouble. And so they're making risky uh, loans. And and uh, so the government has tried to clamp down on that recently uh, by allowing the interbank lending rate to rise. That is the, the interest rate that they pay each other so as not to give them this kind of free ride. But it's, you know, it's, it's had, uh, it's disturbed a lot of things uh, in the markets and everything else. So, they're going to have to deal with that, but I don't think, you know, you see these analogies in the press uh, to kind of what happened here, and I think that um, that's really not analogous. I mean, they don't have a giant bubble that's going to burst and cause a recession like we had here. That Nothing like that is going to happen there. The, the government still controls the banking system, and this is just a question of, you know, basically developing stronger regulation so it doesn't get like uh, something we had here. But, you know, there's a big misunderstanding of what happened here and the cause of the Great Recession. You know, it wasn't so much a financial crisis as it was the bursting of this giant housing bubble. In other words, the financial crisis really only lasted a few months, and the recession was really a result of the loss of, you know, well, construction. And, well, housing equity and the, and the construction in this, you yeah. know, the huge slowdown yeah. in construction. Uh-huh. So they're not going to have that. They've got some problems, but they're dealing with them. And so the idea that, you know, the economy is going to melt down there, I think, is, is way overblown. Okay. And uh, Brazil, we're, you know, again, a, a big day of demonstrations down in Brazil. This started off with people protesting, a, as I recall, a 10 cent, roughly equivalent increase in the cost of bus fares in a couple of their major cities and and now it's gone and and now it's gone national and the protests have expanded to other issues tell us about this well yes it started out with bus fare increase and uh and then you know they were there were other issues raised uh, a whole variety of people because a lot of these people that are involved uh have not been involved in politics before uh and so but they were reacting to things they didn't like about the government some legitimate grievances uh, for example, the spending of tens of billions of dollars on the World Cup uh, and then 2016 Olympics, and they want more spending on health care and education, um, and, uh, you know, things like that. Now, you also have a right-wing media in Brazil. The media is extremely anti-government because you have a left government. Mm-hmm. So the media has put their own spin on it. Some of that has spilled over into the international press. In other words, they put forth uh, things, complaints that they have. Which is that it's government corruption and, and this kind of inflation thing. too. They tried to make it like it's a big deal about inflation. The New York Times had a whole article with graphs about that. And inflation is really it's it's fairly low. It's I mean it's six and a half percent, which for a developing country and for Brazil is not really high. It's at the upper end of their target range from the central bank. So the inflation, you know, that's been exaggerated. Uh, yeah, and corruption. I mean, so the right wing media will use it to discredit the government. That's interesting. But, now uh, Brazil has. has Brazil. I mean, these are. These are yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. But Brazil has a national health care system, and you can get a free college education there. Uh, if I uh, Correct me if I'm wrong. No, that's right, but it's not as widespread as it should be. Uh, and it's, you know, I think it's a very legitimate complaint for people to say that this 
this money uh, should be spent on health care education. They could spend more. Uh, but, you know, this is also a left government. That's a different. I mean, you know, if you look at all the Occupy protests and the kind of social media spread protests throughout the world, you know, Spain, the Arab Spring of those countries, Italy, the Five Star Movement. I mean, these were all protests against governments that were not left wing, even if they were kind of nominally like the the PSOE in Spain, the Socialist Party. Mm. Uh, you know, but this is an actual left government, and they've brought, you know, it's qualitatively different from all previous uh, governments in recent history in Brazil. I mean, they've reduced poverty by 45 percent. Unemployment is at a record uh, or near record lows. Uh, you know, inequality has been reduced. Growth has been twice as fast as it had been over the pre previous 25 years. So, you know, they've accomplished quite a bit. And I think, I mean, if you're interested in the politics, I think that, you know, it's one of several left governments in the region, of course. Most of the governments now in South America are left governments. And this government has pursued a more gradualist approach than, say, Ecuador, Bolivia, Venezuela, or even Argentina. And on the other hand, they've accomplished uh, quite a bit. And uh, But because they've pursued this gradualist approach, uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize how different they are from the other governments. When you, you know, when you're like Rafael Correa in Ecuador, or Evo Morales in Bolivia, where it was kind of the end of an apartheid system mm -hmm. where the indigenous majority didn't even have, you know, participation in the government. You know, there's a striking change and everybody knows it. Mm -hmm. You know, and still, I mean, the economic changes have been big and that's why, you know, Dilma still has a high approval rating and, and, uh, and her predecessor, Lula, the two of them both had the highest approval of any president. Did ever. she, when she was elected, when, when she replaced Lula, did she move to the right, to the left, or did she stay the course? I think she pretty much stayed the course. And in fact, on economic policy, she continued the uh, move away from the neoliberal economic policies that Lula had begun. But it wasn't a drastic break. It wasn't kind of like, again, in the other countries that I mentioned, where there was a sharper, much sharper change in economic policy, and in in in, in the other countries, you had also uh, a bigger expansion of social programs uh, than you had in Brazil. But you had again these really significant changes because of the government's changes in economic policy, and yet Dilma's so, really moved in the same direction. Right. So we we have just a minute left, Mark. Uh, so we have a right wing press. You have a left wing government. How much of the outrage in the streets is being is being stirred up against the government by the right wing press? I don't think it is. I think no. I I, and I, I think they're really, uh, you know, it, the the movement is mostly it's good people with legitimate demands, and the so this is more J curve stuff. People's expectations are not being met. That's right. That's right. You have rising expectations. You have people who have legitimate complaints. And you have a government that has reacted very differently from other governments, you know, uh, not like Turkey or anyone. They have they've they've said, you know, we uh, the president has said this is these protests are good. We appreciate it. We well, she's uh, running for re-election next year. She's running for re-election, but she didn't try to. You know, she could have said, uh, you know, they seized upon the small group of people who were violent, or something right. like that. She didn't do that. Yeah. Okay. Mark Weisbrot, a co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research, co-author of Dean Baker of Social Security, The Phony Crisis, the website CEPR.net. Mark, it's always an honor and a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks for dropping by today. Thanks. Glad to be here. Thank you.